is this. As a cat wanted into their room. He said that this went on for about a year until finally the cat gave up and he had a good night of sleep. Now, not growing up with pets, he wasn't used to the furry antics of these felines. In fact, one night when there was a crash in the house, he instantly thought the house was being broken into. And so he went lurking and looking for the would-be robber with a bat in his hand. And as he opened up the door slowly for in the room that had that crash, he noticed that on the floor was some paw prints and a broken house plant. Ryan was adjusting to life, to his wife's love of cats. Fortunately, there was something in the love bank that had something in it. If you remember that metaphor, we build up the bank in our dating years through love notes and sweet messages and, and dates and watching movies that we don't like. Everyone's thinking, oh, that would be good we need to do for Mother's Day. There you go. Build up that love bank. We build up the love bank because when we are in married life, in that adjustment stage, we're going to make those withdrawals. And it's not so painful. And I can guarantee you, you will make withdrawals. Especially as we move into the next season. Now this stage doesn't have a name. But we all recognize it. Outside forces are affecting our life. And when we settle in, we're going to recognize this in a video called The Not So Newlyweds. Do these pants make me look fat? What? You look like a supermodel. You look fantastic. Newlyweds. Do these pants make me look fat? We could get you a treadmill for Christmas if you really wanted one. <laughs> so newlyweds. Hey, I heard the car pull up. Let me get one of these bags. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Really wet. <laughs> Honey, there's, there's somebody at the door. Absolutely <laughs> wet. You look really handsome tonight. It's only because I have to keep up with my beautiful wife. Really wet. You know, you could at least not wear a hat. Or a pizza joint. Not a rehearsal dinner. Not so many words. Honey, that, you missed your turn. Oh, no. Sorry, I'll turn around. No worries, we can be a little late. Now, I don't now, but I bet I did back then when I was 27. 
Aurora was a big church, 1,000 members. My job was to build up the youth program. Oh, and I was also the first non-full-time associate pastor that Aurora had. The church had to share me with the little church of Bradshaw, which meant that I had to preach every week. And also Bradshaw paid a quarter of my salary, which meant that I was out of the office a quarter of the time in Aurora, and many people in the Aurora congregation weren't used to that. But I was okay with it. I was new. I was brand new. And I wanted to show them I could do it all. And I figured I could. Sarah decided to be a stay-at-home mom at that time. She, had a, she was home with a newborn and a two-and-a-half-year-old. And I admit, I took advantage of that. I worked like a dog. I scheduled meetings late into the evening. And I preached every week. Now, thinking back some 16 years, my life was a I can't believe that I could even think about the details of some of the stories. In fact, Adam Hamilton shares a similar story, similar life experience of him trying to build his church and, and what was taking place in his family life. And he shares a story that I think many of us can relate to. After working late one too many nights, I came home late from another church meeting. I knew I was in trouble when I came around the corner and saw the house. There wasn't a light on anywhere. Levon had put the kids to bed. The house was dark and silent. I went up the stairs. The French doors leading into the bedroom were shut, and my pillow was on the floor outside. <laughs> it was her way of saying, you're overdrawn at the love bank, buddy. Your account is empty. I stood at the door and groveled for a while. Finally, she let me in, but I knew things would have to change. I know if I was to turn this mic over to you, you could share stories of that same period in your life. So what is going on here? This is normal in America. I want to share with you some data. This is called Satisfaction by Time Married. And as you're looking at this, I want to share with you a metaphor from the sports world. Now, I'm not a runner. In fact, when the doctor who operated on me, my, on my knee, told me that it would be a good idea if I don't run, I thought it was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> besides having my three children being born and, and meeting Sarah and getting married. Besides that, I remember sharing this experience with a parishioner of mine who recently had such severe nerve damage in his legs that he could only walk with a cane. And he told me that he missed running so much. He said that, that he told me, started talking to me about this runner's high. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard about it. He loved the point where you got to this, this part where you just felt like you'd run forever. And I remember when he told me that, I was thinking of that scene in Forrest Gump where he's just running forever. But this prisoner told me that the hardest part about simply was getting to that. You had to work through your legs hurting and your lungs hurting and the sweat in your eyes and your mind screaming at you to say, stop, this is stupid. But once you get past that, you get to this runner's high. It's like these endorphins are rushing through and you have this incredible boast of energy. And runners, they, they say, they'll, they'll just run forever. In fact, an 08 German scientist actually did a study of the runner's high. They found that the results were very similar to falling in love. And that your body releases a chemical called endocannabinoid. Recognize the root word? Whoops. Endocannabinoid of the high. But to get to that runner's high, to get there, you've got to go through the trough, I like to call it, of your legs, your lungs, your head, all screaming for you to stop. So let's take a look at this survey data here. This is, notice the trough right here. And so what is going on at this point? Well, your career. You're starting a family. You're adding to your family. There's more responsibilities at work. You're in financial trouble because you've upgraded to a home. There's more expenses. But then you notice that once you get past the trough, there it is, the runner's high. 
But do you notice something about this satisfaction by time married? It takes 40 years of marital bliss to get there. But when you get there, it's almost as high as when you first got married. It doesn't take that long when you run to get past the trough. The results do tell us something. It takes time. It does get better, but it takes time. So what do we do when we've got 35 or 30 or, or 20 years before we're going to get to 40 years of wedded bliss? Well, there's a concept called we do love until we feel love. When Rob and Kristen Bell were 38 years old, they had two boys, 9 and 11 years old, and, and they thought they were going to move on to the next stage of life when they found out they were pregnant. And everything was going okay, okay until about five months into the pregnancy. And Kristen woke up in the middle of the night and she felt like that she couldn't breathe. They called the, the, the ambulance and they went to the ER and, and, and they came to her and they said, Well, there's not much we can do for you. We've never quite seen anything this bad. They diagnosed her with something called pregnancy-induced asthma and sent her home with an oxygen tank. For the next four months of her pregnancy, she was confined to bed rest with an oxygen tank. Frequently, she said that she would be unable to breathe. She felt like she was drowning. And that during the day, she was completely helpless. Everything that she did in her marriage, she could not do. She was so used to giving love, she didn't know how to receive love. And for the first time, she had to rely on Rob to do everything. The chores in the house, the giving the baths, the looking over the homework, preparing the supper, etc. Kristen was completely dependent on him for the remainder of the pregnancy. Now Kristen said for the first time in her marriage, she had nothing to give. She could only receive. And it was, you might imagine, a very humbling experience for her. It was a journey for her to feel vulnerable. And to allow herself to be open to Rob so that she could receive love from him. And as those barriers begin of, of uh, protectiveness and defensiveness to begin to be broken down, she began to understand what Apostle Paul says, that she is indeed someone deeply loved by God. And she learned in that experience that a relationship is a two-way street of giving and receiving. Kristen Bell had moved into a new relationship, into a new stage of her relationship, a season of clothing oneself in a very special kind of love. And we're going to hear about that in our scripture passage from Paul. So go ahead. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, um, Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And to all these qualities add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives is to guide you in the decisions you make. For it is to this peace that God has called you together in one body. And be thankful. Thank you. you know, Paul tells us here that to make a relationship work, we need to clothe ourselves with love. The Greek term that he uses here is agape, and, th and this is important, because and we've mentioned this before, there are multiple words for love in the Greek New Testament, and, and most of them kind of deal with feelings and emotions, kind of when we're thinking about romance. But this is not the word that Paul uses here to refer to love. He says that we cannot command us to feel the emotion of love or bask in romance, but he can tell us to exhibit a love that seeks to bless the other, to build up the other, to embrace and encourage the other. He can urge us toward a love that seeks the other's best without seeking anything in return. You see, when we clothe ourselves in this kind of selfless love, when I'm always seeking your best and you're always seeking mine, that's the kind of love that can work, even when we don't feel it. Last week we talked about this important metaphor. We called it clothing, and we, we referred to the words, I am sorry, I forgive you. 
As we talked with the children today, we learn another word. It's almost kind of an afterthought in the passage from Paul. It's the words, thank you. Love is kind of a posture of thankfulness. It's a clothing metaphor that Paul is fond of. You see, when we gather for worship, we're saying, thank you, God, for all the blessings in our life. We remember this, that love is a gift. We remember that our spouse is a gift to us. So I want us to do an exercise here. I want us to turn to the person sitting in the pew next to you. And I want you to say something very simple to them. I want you just to say, thank you for coming to worship. So go ahead and turn to the person in the pew next to you and say, thank you for coming to worship. Now I want you to turn to the other person on the other side of you and to say, thank you for sitting next to me. you to turn to the person behind you or the person in front of you and thank them for singing because together we all send music up to God and I want you to say thank you for making me a better singer. tell you when we did that exercise in the first service, one person said that was a lie. So I just, and, and no matter what, it did not make him a better singer, but that, that's all right. As we've learned, gratitude is a key to a happy relationship. When we view something and someone with a grateful heart, we can't, we cannot take it for granted anymore. When we constantly thank God for our mate, for our friend, for our co-worker, someone that means something so much to us. We do not treat them poorly, but treasure all that they have and share in their life. <clears throat> to make love last a lifetime, we must believe that the best is yet to come. We must work through that trough, and guess what? It's going to affect all of us. We must clothe ourselves with that message of gratitude. Because in this message, we believe that the best is yet to come. I want to conclude a story with you from the, it's actually the last story in Adam Hamilton's book. He writes, a couple named Ray and Betty were members of our church for many years. It was obvious even, be, even after more than 60 years of marriage that they were very much in love. Betty passed away a couple of years ago. I asked Ray, who still was a regular in worship, for his thoughts on marriage, and this is what he told me. I believe that the great marriages are divided into three phases. First is the honeymoon phase, when couples are madly in love, but most of the attraction is physical. Next is the family phase, when both husband and wife are so busy with children and career that they don't have time for each other like they previously had. They grow apart somewhat. The final phase is the best of all. The family is raised and the children are developing their own lives. Husband and wife rediscover each other and are able to enjoy what they've accomplished with their marriage. Ray went on to say, A short time before I lost Betty, she looked at me and said, Ray, this was the best time of all. At the end, we felt like we were that young couple all over again, madly in love with each other. Thank you for letting me share this important study on love, sex, marriage. May your relationship with your spouse, your friend, your sibling, your pew mate, your colleague be enriched by these words. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. At this time, we 